Okay, so let's start the lecture. Yesterday we talked about basics of operating systems. We saw the history of operating systems. We discussed a few ideas on why we should be studying operating systems. We discussed about the three parts of the course as per the book also. And today we're going to start the first part which is CPU virtualization. And we'll be starting off with the first abstraction that is the process. But before that there was one small component which we didn't cover in the previous class. That is what are some design goals of an operating system. So let's say that you want to design an operating system. What are some things you want to keep in mind? So first of all, you want to have high performance of the operating system, which is that you want to minimize the OS overheads. So we saw yesterday that the OS is doing stuff like helping you to context switch between processes. It's helping you to write stuff to the desk. It's helping you to read stuff from the desk. So it's managing the RAM, uh, CPU, desk in all of these you want to minimize the overhead so you know given an option between an OS that takes about 80% of your SSD versus one which takes 60% of your SSD I'm sure you, you know what to choose so you want to reduce the extra memory the extra CPU and the extra disk requirement of the operating system the second important bit is to protect the application from harming one another and from harming the OS in itself so, so you don't want any application or any program to end up, you know, like viruses do, so they end up harming the OS itself. So you want to build a resilient OS that can help isolate applications from each other. Of course, you want the OS to be reliable because the OS is the program which is always running. So, you know, I have seen some, uh, like some of my flights I've taken, I've seen them running Linux. Uh, on, on the screen management system. So imagine that you're, you know, the autopilot is running on uh, Linux OS and it suddenly crashes. So that could just spell a disaster, right? So you want to have a highly reliable operating system. Or like we discussed yesterday also, we saw Windows XP in many of the ATMs. We don't want it to crash. Or example, if an MRI scan is going on and you know, the machine just reboots on itself. And with the advent of mobile operating systems like Android and iOS, the energy efficiency becomes even more important. And I think this is one of the uh, reasons why Apple devices tend to do usually better because of the time, because of the time they get between the hardware and the software. They don't have to support multiple hardware, so they can you know optimize the hardware for the software and vice versa. Okay, so let's start with the CPU virtualization bit and we're going to start with the first abstraction which is the process. So process in definition is a very simple concept, it's just a program which is running. So program is what you write, let's say a C program and when it's being executed, it's called a process. So in the previous lecture we discussed, you know, if I'm running Keynote or if I'm running Pages, what the stuff is happening. So uh, that, those are also some examples of processes being converted from programs. So let's go over uh, another example of how processes are executed. So this is a more in-depth you know, architecture perspective of the examples which, which we were seeing yesterday. So let's say we have a desk which uh, we are using this symbol to illustrate and we create a program called hello.c. So let in, let's in fact just create one. So we, we just created a really simple hello world program in C. Now we compile it, we get an executable, let's say hello.out. So let's just do that also. So we can now see the hello.out executable being created. Let's now talk only about the executable and forget about the code for now. 
so we have a main memory which is the ram so we need to load this program from the disk into the memory before it's, it can be executed so let's have a look at what this program contains or what this executable contains so i'll be using lldb which is uh, Apple's standard uh, debugger, but you can use GDB on Linux for doing the same thing. So I'll invoke LLDB with hero.out. So I'm, I'm basically trying to show you the instruction set of this executable, of this very simple program. So what I'm doing is uh, DI. So DI here stands for uh, disassemble, I think. Yeah. So we are, we are creating the assembly, showing the assembly code, the assembly code for this executable and I'm showing it for the function called main. So you can now see the various assembly line instruct, the assembly instructions uh, corresponding to this program. You have push, move, XOR, move, pop and return and you can see the various addresses also. And this, and this is showing the relative uh, addresses correspond uh, relative to the main address. So what what is loaded into the memory is called the address space of the process. So what does this address space contain? It contains the code itself. So the let's say it contains all the instructions of the which are going to be executed. It contains all the static data. For example, we initialize int x equal to ten. So it contains those initialization values. It contains the heap. So anyone here knows what, uh, like when do we use a heap? So whenever we're using dynamic memory allocation or we're using the malloc command, let's say, for, uh, to be more specific in C. So we're using the heap for that. And we're using the stack. Anyone wants to tell us why we use a stack? Sorry? So we're using the stack for creating that, you know, function returns. Yes. So we have four different components of the address space, the code itself, the static data, which is the initialized variables, heap containing the dynamic initialization, initialized memory and stack for maintaining the state and for maintaining, uh, for, for capturing all the returns, functions basically. And then we finally have the CPU, which is our main processing engine. So it has, a, it has got a special register called program counter. What does program counter do? It stores the address of the current instruction. So let's say that the program counter points to the first instruction of the code itself. Now we'll have a fetch cycle, which reads the address corresponding to the program counter. We'll have a decode cycle, which will decode it. We'll finally execute this code and we'll update the uh, program counter to the next instruction. So this is in one sense, the entire life cycle of a process. Of course, we're not killing it. And like we can go f uh, further, the program will have an end state and stuff like that. So any doubts till now? Okay, so now it's going to more details of CPU virtualization. So the goal of CPU virtualization is to provide an illusion of many CPUs. So for example, we saw yesterday that we were running many programs together, but each of them, for running each of them, we didn't really bother, you know, will I get a CPU or not? The process, when we run Adobe uh, Illustrator or if we, run, if, we, if we run MS Word, we don't really care whether the CPU is going to be available or not. We just let the OS uh, do all of this stuff. So the goal of the OS is to provide an illusion of uh, many CPUs. And how do we do that? So this is done by a scheme called time sharing. So the CPU has limited cycles. We can share the amount of time being given to different processes. So a way to look at it is, let's say we have four different processes, P1, 2, 3, and 1. So in fact, three processes. So from this point to this time, so this is let's say the time axis, we see that the CPU is executing process 1. At this point, process 1 is stopped, process 2 is executing, P2 is stopped, P3 is executing, and then again P1 comes into uh, the running state. So the CPU, although we have a single CPU, we're able to execute multiple of these processes by starting and stopping, 
by dividing the time of the CPU. So a related, uh, related concept is uh, space sharing. So let's say this is our disk. We have different programs and each of them is uh, you know, having some space on the disk. So while for the CPU we are sharing the time, for the memory, for the hard disk we are sharing the space. This is just to give you an idea of how sharing mechanisms in general work. Let's now take an example of how virtualization will work and what are the two main components of virtualization. So let's say we have process one running at this point of time and there are three programs or which want to run. So at, at this point they're just programs because they're not executing. We have P2, P3 and again P1 wants to run, let's say. So how do you decide which program has to run? So there is a component called an OS scheduler which contains the policies corresponding to which, which will decide which program has to next run and what will that policy look like. So it will take as function you know the runtime of different pro, uh, processes or programs. You know one policy might say that run the smallest program or one policy might say that run the program which requires least input output. So these are the policies which are decided by the operating system. Uh, there are also different ways, the policy also can maximize for the metric. Let's say the metric we want to optimize is the average running time of all the processes. Or the metric we want to optimize is you know, how quickly a program is first executed. That's just called the response time. And the type of processes. Let's say we want to first execute all input output processes or if we want to execute all CPU intensive processes. So we'll go into the details. Uh, in the next few lectures. This is just to give you an overall idea of that the first component is an OS scheduler. This is going to tell you which program to run and uh, let's say the OS scheduler decided that we want to run P2. Now we require some low level mechanisms which then actually go about running P2. So in these low level mechanisms what we'll do is to take out P1, store its state bring in P2 and that's how context switch will happen. So we have two components, one is a high level component deciding which program to run. The second one which is low level mechanisms which say that how to run these programs. Yeah. Uh, is the state stored in the program's own virtual memory? I'm thinking out aloud. I think it will be stored in some something which is common across processes. Yeah, I don't have a really good answer for that. I'll come back to it. So there are a few important uh, API calls that any OS should support for for the process management. The first is creating processes. So for example, whenever we are double clicking a program, a process is created from a program or we can run on a command line. So all of this is possible only because the operating system provides an API to create a new process. Uh, once we have created something, we also have to have an API to destroy a process. So we can destroy it via various mechanisms. We can destroy it via task manager or command line. But all of this works only because the OS has provided uh, an abstraction in the form of an API. We have certain processes where we want to wait for something. Uh, for example, we don't want something to run before some other process has completed. Any example you want to give for this, where you want to wait for some other process to complete. Input. Yeah, so taping, taking input, uh, input output, you, you, the program goes into a different state. Or let's say that you know we, we run Adobe Illustrator as we were running yesterday. We probably want to wait to show the main GUI before all of the initialization has been done. You know, all of the components have been loaded. So you don't want to show a partial state. You have the toolbox on the left, right? So let's say that toolbox is a different process. 
till the time it's not loaded, we'll probably want to wait before showing all of the mains. And a status. So with status, you want to know, you know, what the state the program currently is. How long and has it run? What the state it is. Uh, the so question for all of you to to figure out on your own is like, does commands do commands like top and ps give us the entire status of the program or not? And if they do, what else? What are things do they provide us? And miscellaneous other uh, functionality has to be there provided by the OS, such as suspend a program. So broadly, a program can be in three different states. It could be running. So running means that the program is currently being executed by the CPU. It could be in a ready state. So in a ready state means that the program by itself can execute. But let's say for it's for some reason it's not being able to execute. So let's say that the CPU is executing some other program. If it's executing P1, P2 cannot execute at the same time. So P2 will be in a ready state at that time. And then a program can go into block state. So let's say a program one wants to initiate an input output. It will be in a block state now because it cannot access the CPU now. So it's it's a reasonable decision to let other programs run on the CPU during that time. So let's take a really simple example. We have process 0 shown on the lower y, uh, like y equal to 0 and let's say process 1 show, shown as y equal to 1. So in the first four cycles, the program P0 is running. So during that time, while P1 is ready to execute, it cannot execute because the CPU has already been occupied by the other program. So it will continue to remain in the ready state, which is the green state. And after the CPU is available, then uh, after P P0 has ended, then P1 starts executing. So it's a very simple example of two, two processes running in different states. Let's take a slightly more complicated example. So let's say that program P0 uh, requires the CPU from time 0 to 3. After that, so during this phase, we see that process 1 is still in the ready state. So it can execute any time the CPU is available. At time t equal to 3, process P0 goes into a block state. So by block state, it means that it requires the, it, it says that I want to access the input output. So at that point, it makes sense to bring P1 into execution because P0 is already looking for input output. You don't want to waste that time. So process P0 goes into the red state here shown as the block state. And in that time, process P1 starts executing on the CPU. Now at time t equal to 7, the input output of P0 has finished and it goes into the ready state. So it can execute at that time. But in this case, uh, what is happening is P1 continues to execute till it's finished. So these are, the, these are some of the questions which an operating system has to answer, like at time t equal to 7, does it run P0 or does it run P1? How do you decide that? So that is decided by the scheduling policies which we uh, saw in the previous slide. So now we look at some examples of how different processes can be scheduled in this way. So the authors have provided some really good code on you know, showing how different processes are executed. Not, not exactly showing which of them are executed, but how you would end up scheduling them. So what I'm doing here is, I'm running this Python program, which is just uh, giving us a simulation. I am, let me in fact, yes. So the, the purpose of this uh, example or this simulation is to show us a diagram something like this, so which shows that process ID 0 has access to CPU and process ID 1 is in the ready state at this point of time and when, uh, when this program is being run. So it gives us various uh, options. So 
so the most important option here is to is l which lets us input the process list so in the process list we give the form uh, x1 comma y1 where x1 stands for the number of cpu instructions we want to execute and y1 stands for the probability of uh, an instruction being a cpu so if y1 is 100 it means that all instructions are going to be uh, cpu instructions y1 equal to 0 means all instructions are going to be input output and of course there is a random element to this whole simulation because probability so when we say that with the probability of 10 for different random seeds you know we might have let's say five instances being chosen as input output compared to four instances or three instances. So that's another argument which we can uh, give here, minus s uh, corresponding to the seed. So let's run a very simple example first. So we want to execute a, a single process which requires five CPU instructions and with the probability of 100% these will be CPU instructions. So it's, it's fairly simple here, right? So we process zero runs, we run. Yeah, so this is what is happening. So at all of these five points, since the probability of running on the CPU is 100%, these get executed just really on the CPU. There is no input output. And as we would expect the statistics, the CPU is kept busy 100% of the time, which is something which we always want to do, to keep the CPU always busy. And input output, because there is none, uh, the input output busy is 0%. Let's change this 100 to 10%. So now we'll have a lot more input outputs. Uh, so we'll probably not finish in five seconds now, because we'll have some input outputs with a probability of 90%. We will require many more time cycles to complete this instruction, uh, to complete this process. So in fact, it takes now 26 uh, cycles, uh, time cycles to complete this process. So what happens here is, uh, at the first time instant, time instance, the CPU, we, we allocate the CPU to the process, but then it requires an input output uh, to be executed. So it goes into a waiting state. Uh, it's waiting for the CPU to, uh, to to get a CPU. Then again, it gets a CPU, but again, it requires uh, input output at the next step. So we see that the CPU is busy only in the five out of the 26 cycles. Uh, the, the utilization rate is fairly low. Let's change the seed, random seed, to something else. And so by changing the random seed, the number of input output cycles or the CPU cycles will change. So let's see what happens. Uh, did anything change? No. So now we can see a change, right? So now it's completed in 21 cycles. So this is showing another possible instantiation or other possible, uh, you know, simulation of how different processes could have been run. Let's now create another process which requires one CPU instruction and with a probability of 100, it will be a CPU instruction. So we see that process P1 at time T1, process P1 has access to CPU, but then it requires, it executes, it wants to access the input output and at time T1, process ID is in the ready state because it can execute, it doesn't require anything else. Uh, at time t2, process ID 0 goes into the waiting state because it's now um, accessing the input output. And PID 1 can execute because it only requires uh, the CPU. And at this point of time, it's already been completely executed. If we were to change, let's say, to require, you know, both of the processes were fairly similar. Both of them require five CPU instructions and with a probability of 10, they have uh, CPU usage. So it takes 27 time cycles to complete this, the two processes. And the CPU 
is busy on 10 out of the 27 cycles, so the utilization of CPU is around 37%. If, so let's say we have a very long process. Uh, let's say it requires 50 cycles. And with a probability of 100%, these will all be CPU cycles. Whereas there is a really small process. And with a probability of 10, it will be uh, requiring the CPU. So what happens here is that you see that process ID PID1, it has to keep on waiting till the 51st cycle to, to execute. So how many of us have encountered this, you know, we go to the grocery store and we just have a single item. Let's say we just want to buy a toothbrush. Whereas the person in front of us is, you know, almost buying an entire home. So how frustrating it is, you know, we just, we, we want to almost say, sir, ma'am, we just have a single item, it will take us 30 seconds, whereas we'll have to wait for 30 minutes for you to, you know, just buy your own new home from the grocery store, buy the entire grocery store. So this is what is happening in this uh, case. That is why CPU scheduling is an important subject, uh, is an important topic. So what we're missing here is the, uh, the element of interactivity. The other program keeps on waiting, keeps on waiting. You know, what do you think might have been a better solution? Run this second program because it requires only a single cycle, and the average running time would have reduced the the uh, average time to completion would have reduced the interactivity would have improved because the other process as such will lose only a single cycle. It will complete so instead of completing in uh, let's say 50 cycles, it will complete on the 50 hours time cycle. Not a huge difference for it. But for the other program, it makes a lot of difference. So these are some of the things we'll be studying in the next few lectures. And with this, with a simulation tool, like you can play around with different uh, arguments and you know, develop a better understanding. So that's mostly it for today's lecture, unless and until you have some doubts or any questions. And I'll get back to you on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's an excellent question, and we we will be covering this in the future class. So before running, like it requires an oracle to know, you know, how much time a program will use. What people generally use is some historical information, uh, you know, on these types of processes. How long have they generally taken? Uh, but before running, you never know that. So that that becomes uh, you know that becomes an interesting challenge. That how do you account for something which which is you know uh, undeterministic? Uh, why is it? Uh, why is it waiting? Okay, so uh, so it should have. Oh, okay, so it's waiting because uh, program two also wanted to do some input output. So let's say if program two was only a CPU instruction. So with 100% probability, it will be a CPU instruction. Then it will complete in the 51st cycle. So now it's completed in the 51st cycle. But in that case, the previous case, it wanted to do, you know, with the probability of 90%, some input output also. So it does some input output here. So let's let's pick up some other random seed. And let's see how how many it is. Uh, one, two, three, four again. Yeah. So in this particular case. Even though the probability of choosing the CPU is only 10%, in this case, it's chosen the CPU, only the CPU cycle, and with a probability of, uh, like, it's actually chosen the CPU cycle. So with different random seeds, you can uh, choose. So if you want to, you know, understand how this might work. <coughs> uh, probability, how do we pass the probability?
Okay, so we run this very simple program in uh, Python. So we we're running, we're taking, uh, we're generating a random number between zero and one, and we're doing it thousand times. Uh, whenever it's greater than zero point eight, they increase the count by one. So what would you expect the count value to be? Around two hundred. Let's see. 191, let's run it again. So every time you run, you basically see different times a thing has been chosen. So let's say with the probability of 10, we were writing something. And in some cases, it might be chosen. In some cases, you might choose only input-output. In some cases, you might choose in them in the correct ratio. So that's how generally random stuff happens. So one of the ways, so one of the things, whenever you're doing some random experiments, you like to do is to run it over various random seats and then show the mean and the standard deviation so that what you're reporting is not over a single uh, random set. In simulation, you're randomizing the so so the prob so when you mention the probability, so you say that with the probability of zero point to one or ten percent, uh, you should be choosing a CPU cycle. So that that is with the with different random seeds that the number of times the CPU cycle is chosen would be varying. Uh, can we change the number of uh, waiting cycles for? Uh, it waits. It means that it has to wait for the uh, input output to finish. Yes, so here it's always four. Uh, no, it was not four. It was zero also one time. So if we look at. So here in this particular case, the for the second process, so we are not. We don't have a single input output. Yes, so cycle for an input output. Let's say input output has happened. Okay. No, oh, is that so? Yes. Let's see. Uh, so input output is happening here. So these are four cycles. I think there was some some argument also. So you can mention, yeah. So it says that how long inputs input output takes to complete default is five ticks. So we can change this also. I think.
I think it's a fantastic program that the book authors have provided to help us get a better understanding understanding of our stuff is happening. Any other questions? So, uh, in the meanwhile, can you circulate a uh, sheet for the attendance? Yes, so, I also want to have some idea on, you know, how uh, how comfortable are you people with uh, writing in C? So okay. you've, you've done, um, like you're comfortable with writing heaps and trees and linked lists and those stuff? So we had a course. What's the course? Uh, ESA and ESA. Achha. Oh, so you have done two, two we specific? We did some programming assignments, so we were uh, able to implement linked lists. So how many of you, uh, you know, face stuff like segmentation fault? Yeah, so in this, in this OS course, you will get to understand that, you know, what does segmentation fault actually mean? What is segmentation and why is the fault occurring? And how many of us have used uh, GDB or some debugger before? Okay, not not everyone. So I'm thinking of uh, you know creating the contents for the first lab. Uh, and you want the labs to be two hours, or you know you want lab of one hour and one hour for uh, you know office hours, something like that. What would you two hours lab, so that you can finish an hour and leave? Nothing bad in that. I mean, I would have preferred that also. Okay, so now for now at least, uh, let's keep the two hours lap and later on figure out because as such there are no office hours for this course. Given that there is already three hours lectures, two hours lap, so it's already pretty heavy. And all of you would be pretty comfortable with Python also, right? Is that the case also with the EE folks? So you're comfortable with both Python and C. So you people have also done a, a data structures course, both the courses. Okay. So if, if you were to like, if I were to give you a program to you know write such a simulator, so are you comfortable? Do you think you would be able to write? one uh, like this. I think that's a really good exercise to do. You know, you then get a really good understanding of how context switches would happen or how you'd have to wait, keep a program, except a different program in a running state. And I think this is an example of a really, really well written code. So you have different command line arguments. Almost looks like a good uh, Unix utility. You could also vary the number of, uh, you know, Processes. So we'll be using some variants of this code to understand various other scheduling algorithms. Like for example, we were discussing now that the one of the program had to wait for 50 cycles even though it had a single CPU cycle. That those who have uh, done their attendance may leave the list too. Process API. So APIs are generally, you know, uh, in some sense, in a very rudimentary sense, they are ways, uh, they are, so they are means which someone provides to 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 make it easy to access their you know system. For example, we have. So have you heard of uh, REST APIs? So various uh, you know services. Let's say database. So it's it can be really hard to access a database, right? Or if you are accessing a database over a remote server, it can be hard at times. You know you need to figure out all the SQL or whatever the kinds of uh, programming environments they are running on. But let's say we, they, that database vendor provides a REST API. So they are providing you an easy way to access the services. 
that's in general the meaning of an uh, API. So the benefit of APIs in this case is, let's say that you know tomorrow you are you know working for let's say Adobe, you don't have to really worry about you know understanding how the CPU will work, understanding assembly instructions. You can just use the API. You can say that you know whenever. Uh, so for example, when you're running Adobe Illustrator. You have to execute many processes. So you have to initialize all of your components. You have to initialize the artwork. You have to initialize the toolboxes. You don't have to go down to the CPU level and you know say that execute this assembly level. All you can say is that I want to create a new process. Uh, this will be a child process. This will uh, this will be it. Uh, this will be the stuff it will return. And you want to do other things that you know till this particular process has run. I'll keep on waiting before I run the main GUI. So you, when when you have that high level abstraction, then it makes stuff easier, and you keep on periodically checking the status of the different uh, programs which have executed. 